Well, good morning. Good morning again. Today, in light of what we have just sung, that God is good, I want to talk about making your marriage good because God is great. I want to talk this morning about making your marriage great. I want to paint a picture, actually, for you who aren't married, for you who were married, for you who are married, and for you who, like me, have been married again. A husband, a middle-aged husband, asked his wife one day, do you still fantasize about me? And she said, well, of course. I fantasize about you regularly. I fantasize about you taking out the trash, cutting the grass, doing the dishes. <laughs> and she went on and on. Now, fantasizing is a piece, but when I'm talking about making a marriage great, I mean a marriage that overflows with life and love, just as God overflows with life and love. And what Christianity brings to the table is that great marriages are characterized by three things, truth, love, and grace. You see, it's truth that keeps things honest. It's love that keeps you connected. And it's grace that empowers you to forgive. But before we jump in and look at these three, Christianity offers us a caution. According to the Bible, if we are to have a great marriage, there's a trap we have to avoid, and I want to address it on the front end. And that is the trap of making marriage primary and Jesus secondary. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, but seek me first, or seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus doesn't say seek marriage first, seek parenting first. He says seek me first, and along the way, one of the things God will give you is a great marriage. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been meditating on one verse in the Psalms, it's Psalm 24, uh, 27, verse 4, where the psalmist says, one thing I desire from the Lord. One thing I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord and to behold the beauty of the Lord. Now, the one thing isn't marriage. It isn't your job. It, it isn't approval. It isn't security. It isn't sex. The one thing is Jesus. And to the extent we desire this one thing, we seek this one thing. He's talking about our heart. Everything else in our life will, will follow. But when he says, behold the beauty of the Lord, what he is saying, the one thing you're seeking is knowing, experiencing, beholding Jesus Christ. Marriage is not ever intended to be primary. Primary. Jesus is primary. After all, Jesus, the Apostle Paul, uh, were never married. And, and to be not married, what, what are we going to suggest? That that's somehow a second-class uh, person? Absolutely not. Jesus is always primary. Our circumstances differ for each and every one of us. <laughs> this is why Francis Chan, in his book on marriage, you'll see the title in just a moment, says that we don't really have marriage problems. Our marriage problems aren't really marriage problems. They're Jesus problems, God problems, where one or, or, or both of us in a, in a marriage either have a poor relationship with God or a faulty understanding of God. Now, let me come in this, at this through a back door. Look at this quote from a woman who's a quadriplegic. Her name is Johnny Erickson Tata, and she says, talking about her life in a wheelchair, I realized that the stakes were far greater, far more immense and cosmic than merely my satisfaction with a wheelchair 
and its unpleasant baggage. Now, by unpleasant baggage, he's referring to herself. I shifted my focus onto God. His glory was at stake. And that made my satisfaction in him the real issue. It was no longer a matter of being content with his plan for my life. Now catch this sentence. It was a matter of finding him utterly and supremely the source of all my contentment. This, much to my delight, would give him the greatest glory. Now that's the Christian perspective. That regardless of how satisfying or unsatisfying your marriage is, the real issue is your satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Because he is primary. He is first. He is the one thing. So whether your marriage is full of joy or your marriage is full of pain, God's glory is always, every minute of your marriage, at stake. And so my point is, if your engine is bad, it doesn't matter if you change your tire. When Jesus is supreme, when Jesus is your king, when you see Jesus as as beautiful, then truth, love, and grace will overflow. So what's first in your life? What's primary? What is it today, right now? Now let's go on. Let's get to our passage. We're going to look at two verses, actually a total of four verses, in the New Testament letter called Ephesians. Paul is the author, and he wrote to people in and around the city of Ephesus. As a matter of fact, in eight days I'm going to be in Ephesus. Some of the greatest archaeology in the world, first century archaeology, is in this ancient city of Ephesus. And Paul writes this letter to these Christians to help them keep on keeping on. And we want to pick it up in chapter 4 and verse 15. Paul says, instead, speaking the, and here it is, truth in love, We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him that is, uh, who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament. Now, ligament is a metaphor here for you and me in the body of Christ. And builds itself up in love just as each part, that is each person, does what God has gifted and called he or she to do. Now, here, the, here Paul begins a long section all the way through most of chapter 5 talking about relationships in the family of God, how we as believers w- relate to one another. But in these two verses, I want to zero in on the context of marriage and l- apply this to marriage. So let's start with the beginning. Look at ver- the beginning of verse 15. Paul says, speaking the truth. In the Greek, it's just one word. It's the word truthing, a reference not merely to the words we speak, but the orientation of our lives. We're truth seekers. Truth matters to us. Yet today, in our modern Western worlds, what we have done is we have replaced divine truth with personal truth, right? I mean, my truth. And we hear people say, who in the world are you to tell me what truth is? There's no such thing as absolute truth. So no longer divine truth, but personal truth. However, when Paul begins this long section, uh, two chapters on relationships with the one word truthing, he is doing what? He is laying the sociological and moral foundation for culture. And at the very beginning, he is saying, few things are more important to relationships, to marriage, than truth. Truthing. You see, it's not a fail, it's not failure that kills our marriages, because we all fail. It's deceit, pretension. Lying. 
Now let me apply this. Let me take this a step further. Uh, Truthing here means, of course, the words we speak. But it also is much broader than that, as I mentioned. And it also means our ability to receive truth. God doesn't merely want you to confront your spouse. God wants your spouse to confront you. How are we going to discover our blind spots? I heard somebody say last week that 30% of our lives are blind spots, blind to us. How are we ever going to figure out our blind spots, those values and attitudes and reactions uh, that are negative? How are we ever going to identify them? How are we ever going to grow? How are we ever going to change if we are so defensive, so uptight, so close, so unteachable that we can't receive truth from our spouse? Few things, few things are more critical to a great marriage than the ability to speak and receive truth. And let me tell you how I blew it. A couple of years after Rhonda and I were remarried, I've told this story once before, uh, we're remarried following the deaths of our two previous spouses. I was cooking chicken on the grill. Now, I love when it comes to cooking on the grill, the colors red and pink. I love everything undercooked. But since I'm not the physician in our marriage and my wife Rhonda is the physician, I didn't really understand the science. I I didn't really listen to her repeated insistence that you can get really sick, Rob, if you undercook hamburger and chicken. After all, I am the master of my grill. And why do I need to listen to my wife, the doctor? So on this ill-fated night, I undercooked the chicken. And here's the hard part for me to admit. When Rhonda asked me to put it back on the grill, I, I refused. And to prove my point, I ate all my chicken. Now, I don't know if I got a call or something, but I had to step out of the room, and suddenly Rhonda and our daughter Christine are racing to the microwave, and they cook their chicken for two and a half hours. (laughs) Make sure that baby is done. So I ate this undercooked chicken. Now, you know where the story is going. About two in the morning, I woke up. I was violently ill. I I, I was so ill, and I was bugging Rhonda, and Rhonda, you know, had to be thinking, you know, he, he just wouldn't listen. So what did Rhonda do? Rhonda locked me in the bathroom for hours. Not really. She took me to the emergency room. And I spent a a really bad night in the hospital because I was feeling so awful. But what had been happening, and men hear me, Rhonda, my lovely wife, had been truthing me, but in my arrogance and my overconfidence, I could not receive the truth. It's worse. God had ordained my wife to help me, but I refused. In not listening to her, I was not listening to God. What's your grill? Is it your job? Is it your anger? Is it the way you spend your money, the, what you do with your free time? Is it this? Is it that? Now, my story gets worse because the next morning I was released from the hospital, but Rhonda had to go to work to take care of patients that would listen. <laughs> and so I went out in the lobby and I was waiting for my ride to pick me up and I felt awful. I looked awful. You know, it's one of those moments I don't want anybody in the world to ever, ever see me. And I'm sitting there in this chair all hunkered down. And, and this lovely woman begins to ask me some questions. And I did not want to talk at all, but uh, being the gentleman that I am, I did. And after a couple of minutes, she, you know what she said to me? She said, you sound just like the pastor of my church. 
And I'm like, oh, no, this is not going to end well. And so I said, what church? And she said, Wheaton Bible Church. And I said, I am. And she said, no, you're not. You don't look anything like him. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> you look nothing like him. And so I'm, Ugh. Now, when Paul in verse 15 says, truthing, he is saying, I want all of you to hear me in this, whether you're single, whether you're a divorcee, regardless of your situation in life. He is saying receiving truth is essential to life. It's essential to marriage. Otherwise, we become a shadow of ourselves. Otherwise, in, in, in contrast to all that God intended us to be and to live in his glory, we become almost unrecognizable relative to that because we're not teachable, coachable. Are you willing, open to receive truth? Do you love truth? Are, are, are you non-defensive, open, uh, would your spouse say you're teachable, humble? So that's truthing. It's critical, critical to a great marriage. Now let's go on to love, which is equally as important. And let's put verses 15 and 16 back on the screen. At the beginning of verse 15, Paul says, speaking the truth or truthing in love. Then near the end of verse 16, he says it again. He says the body of Christ is to grow and to build itself up in love. Both words are the one Greek word agape. Paul is talking about agape love, which means self-sacrificial, other-centered love. It's a love of commitment, the love of service. Now here's how I want you to think about agape love relative to your marriage. What is it? It's you disadvantaging yourself to the advantage of another. It's an act of your will. It's Jesus in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Marital greatness means you regularly disadvantage yourself to advantage your spouse. And every moment you do that, you're following Jesus, and you can't do that apart from Jesus. Now, let me apply this in two ways. First, it means you must communicate in a way that works for the both of you. That second part is really important in a way that works for the both of you. So let's say you're not a talker. You're a man of action in few words, and you know that, you're, and your wife knows that. Because you're a man who seeks Jesus first because he's the one thing you're after, you know that telling yourself and telling your wife, hey, I'm not a talker is a non-starter. So what do you do? Well, you talk. Uh, you ask questions, and you answer questions with more than the one word, fine. Man, you lost your job today. I can't believe that. I'm so sorry. How are you doing? Fine. That's what the non-talkers among us want to do. But you don't do that. Uh, not because you don't want to do that or not because that's not who you are, but because self-denial is central to marital communication. It's agape love. Or let's say you're the opposite. You're the talker. and You process out loud and you talk and you, lo you love to talk and uh, so here you have this, um, you're married to someone who doesn't like to talk as much. And so what does self-denial look like in that context? Well, it means you're not trying to change your spouse. And it means you're not throwing 
him or her under the bus in your mind. It means you're not harboring resentment. Uh, You're not trying to make them something that they simply can't be. So you relax, you ratchet it down. It's self-denial. And I say this with all sincerity. You understand and you keep reminding yourself that your greatest conversations will only and ever be with Jesus. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Always, again, I say rejoice. Because sometimes we're in a marriage where we can't rejoice in our spouse. And then he goes on and he says, after live vertically, he says, let your patience be evident to all because the Lord is near. Your focus is on Jesus, you're patient because your confidence is that he knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your wheelchair, if you will. Uh, The second way I want to apply this is love means you work, you work, you work to become best friends. I I was stunned to discover this some years back because we tend to think what the most important characteristic in a great marriage is, we tend to think that that most important characteristic is communication or maybe having common interests or sometimes we think it's... um, You know, the ability to avoid conflict or handle conflict well. But you know what research says today? Research says none of those are the most important characteristic of a good marriage. What is the most important characteristic of a good marriage is friendship. Not communication, not common interests, not the presence or absence of conflict. It's friendship. And by friendship, I mean a mutual respect for and an enjoyment of your spouse, each other's company. So look at how uh, this major marital researcher, John Gottman, put it. He writes, the determining factor in whether wives feel satisfied with the sex, romance, and passion in their marriage is by 70% the quality of the couple's friendship. For men, the determining factor is by 70% the quality of the couple's friendship. So men and women come from the same planet after all. (laughs) We see this in the Bible. So for example, in the Old Testament book of Song of the, the Song of Songs, the young bride is describing her husband in lavish terms. And then in chapter 5 and verse 16, she says this, he is my beloved and he is my friend. Do you say that? Can you say that? What is friendship? Friendship means we know one another in our marriages intimately. We know what uh, uh, our spouses like, what their dislikes are. We know what their quirks are. We know what their triggers are. Uh, their fears and their hopes. And we work to stay connected. Nathaniel, for example, works very long hours. And in any other marriage, his long, long hours would have destroyed that marriage. But Nathaniel and Olivia found ways to stay connected. They actually work on it to stay friends. So one of, their, one of their primary things is, man, they talk to each other on the phone during the day. If Olivia has a doctor's appointment, Nathaniel remembers and he calls. If he has a big mini- meeting, then Olivia does the same. She calls. They love to cook for each other, especially on the weekends. Olivia's family-oriented. Nathaniel, not so much. So Nathaniel has learned to bend. Now then Gottman, the researcher, adds this. Through small but important ways, Olivia and Nathaniel are maintaining the friendship that is the foundation of their love. As a result, they have a marriage that is far more passionate than do couples who punctuate their lives together with romantic vacations and lavish anniversary gifts. I talked to this Rhonda last night about these anniversary gifts in light of this quote. I thought it was really good. But they've fallen out of touch in their daily lives. Friendship fuels the flames of romance because it offers the best protection against feeling adversarial 
toward your spouse. Because Nathaniel and Olivia have kept their friendship strong despite the inevitable disagreements, irritations of married life, they are experiencing what is known as positive sentiment override, which means that their positive thoughts about each other and their marriage are so pervasive that they supersede their negative feelings. Man, man, is, is communication important? Yes, critical. Common interest? Absolutely. The ability to engage in conflict in a constructive way, well, few things are as important, but nothing, nothing, nothing is more important than friendship. What does agape love look like in a marriage? It means you work and continue to work to be best friends. Now let's go on. Truth keeps us honest. It keeps things honest. Love keeps us connected. It keeps us intimate. And now grace. Grace is what enables you to forgive. You see, truth can become hard if it's not softened by love. And love can become soft if it's not strengthened by truth. But it's grace that creates the platform for both of those to run on. Grace is described in verse 16 in the first two words. When Paul says, from him, from who? From Jesus. Now, what's from Jesus? And in this context, what he's saying is growth, spiritual growth. The growth in our relationships, the growth in the body of Christ, the growth in our marriage is growth in truth and love, which is how he begins verse 15. And what he says, these truth and love are grace gifts. You and I are totally dependent upon God to be people of truth and to be people of love. Now, let me tease this out. Let's bounce down to the last two verses of chapter 4. Paul writes, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, he's talking about two subjects in these two verses. He's talking about first repentance and then second forgiveness. What is repentance? Repentance is making a U-turn. It's instead of merely saying I'm wrong, it's changing your direction. Now look at verse 31. It's getting rid of bitterness and rage and anger and replacing it with kindness and compassion. Verse 32. Now repentance comes from God. And my experience with repentance is I desperately need the grace of God. The second subject here is forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is letting someone who has hurt you off the hook. It's not holding what they have done against them. Forgiveness is one of the most difficult, one of the most complex, one of the most agonizing and one of the most prolonged things to work out in life. And you and I can't forgive apart from grace. Tony and Megan uh, were this close to divorce. They went to a counselor. And the entire time all Tony did was complain about Megan's shortcomings. The whole time, the only thing Megan did was complain about Tony's shortcomings. There was never any ownership of anything they did. It was always Tony saying Megan. It was Megan always saying Tony. There was no, instead of she's responsible, I'm responsible, none of that. Now, there's a term for this, a term rather more accurately for what's underneath what's going on there, and it's the biblical concept of self-righteousness. Uh, what is self-righteousness? 
Self-righteousness is where you condemn your spouse, but you coddle yourself. It's the Pharisees in the Gospels. Self-righteousness in any relationship is you condemn others, but you coddle yourself. And it makes repentance and forgiveness impossible. So as I wind this up, I want to conclude by asking this question. How do we break that cycle of self-righteousness, unrepentance, unforgiveness in a marriage relationship? And the answer is Jesus and his grace. His mercy. And it's described at the end of verse 32, where Paul says, in the, talking about forgiveness, he's talking about grace in the language of forgiveness, forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. What is grace? What is boots on the ground grace in a marriage? It's you forgiving your spouse because you know God has forgiven you in Jesus Christ. It's knowing that no sin committed against you could ever be as serious as the innumerable sins you have committed against God. So you extend grace because with Jesus as primary, you are being transformed by the grace of God that you have received because you believe in Jesus. You believe Jesus suffered and died in your place for your sin. Rather, I should say, your lifetime of sin. But according to verse 32, if you look at it closely, the only way you will ever extend forgiveness, the only way you will ever extend grace in tight places, I mean difficult places, I mean when you're as mad as a hornet, is understanding the forgiveness and grace that you have received. To extend, you must receive. To know that you receive or you have received means you can extend. And I want to ask the question, how? How do we get there? And here's the biblical answer. We see this over and over. The answer is you take your eyes off your spouse, off your spouse's failures. You take your eyes off... uh, uh, your self-pity, this wheelchair you have placed yourself in of sorts. And you understand that the flaming sword of judgment that barred Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden after they sinned bars all of humanity from the presence of God. But God, in this incomprehensible and comprehensive act of grace, allowed that sword of judgment to fall on Jesus Christ on the cross when he died and bore your sin. And if that knowledge of this incredible grace God has given you in Jesus moves your heart, then it becomes power for you to seek the truth and to extend love. Grace. A great marriage is a function of what you do. But more deeply, and this is why I began the way I did, more deeply it's a function of what you believe. Is Jesus the one thing you seek? Is he primary? I don't know how else you survive life in a wheelchair. I don't know... How, how, how you survive disappointment in marriage. Have you received Jesus? Have you said yes to this grace that he offers you? This love, this life-changing power? If not, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus now. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for how practical the Bible is. Open our hearts and our minds. God, deliver us from our defensiveness. 
And give us the grace. Block on Jesus. Amen.